that uh, Forrest is not here with us today. He, uh, he's, he and, and Gail in particular are here every Sunday working, working really hard, and they're here on Tuesday nights practicing with us, with the band, and this is an unsolicited commercial, but uh, I just want you to know that if you have musical talents and abilities, we'd love to have you join us up here. We'd love to be to the place where we can have multiple bands and uh, give give people opportunity to have some some uh, option to share their gifts. Um, if you sing, if you play, if you play an instrument that you don't see up here the, near the end of the month, we'll have a, a violinist back with us, and uh, really adds a lot to it. So if you play something, I mean, I can't imagine an instrument we won't use. Maybe a tuba. I don't know, but but if you have God has given you that ability. We'd love to have you join us. Um, and the other reason I brought that up and mentioned Forrest not being here is I would, I would love it. He would never ask for anything like this. But you don't know the work that Forrest and Thorne, the guy back there at the soundboard, turn around and wave at Thorne. Thorne, wave your hand. <clears throat> the work that they have done and continue to do to make sure that our sound system and our uh, our, our ability to communicate on Sunday morning continues to get better and better. If you were here a few months ago, you know we were we were struggling pretty hard, and uh, we're not now. And it's because of the effort they put into it. And uh, I just want to call that to your attention, so you can, you know, ev- as you see them, or maybe even seek them out on a Sunday, say thank you, and just appreciate them. They don't do it for the for the accolades at all. There's not a person up here that does it for that reason. But to say thank you, especially to those two guys, would, would mean a lot to, to us as a band. Because we, we see all the work that they do behind the scenes. So let me pray with a, for us again. Father, I'm so grateful that you give each and every one of us gifts and abilities. And you, you invite us to be involved in the work that you have going on around the world and in this local place. Father, I want to thank you for every person that's here for the gifts and abilities that you have entrusted to each one of us. And I pray that you will show each and every one of us where you want us to use those gifts, whether it's on on the job or whether it's in school, whether it's in our neighborhoods, whether it's here in the church. We just thank you for, for having a purpose and a plan for every single one of us and how you want us to fit within your kingdom work and within this body. Thank you for the privilege you give me to open up the word every Sunday. And I pray, Father, that you would allow me to speak on your behalf. Um, I'm not qualified, but your spirit can work through me, and I invite him to do that. And I just ask you, Lord, to meet every one of us in that place that we all know that we need to hear from you. And maybe some places we don't even realize. So we just yield ourselves to you. We open ourselves up, and we ask you to open us even more with your word. In Jesus' name. So according to Dr. Gary Chapman, everyone has a love language. A love language is what someone speaks to us that communicates to us that they love us. Now, anybody read the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman? It is like, it's amazing to me. Um, It's an amazing book. It's been on like the New York Times top seller list for years and years. It's, It's the number like among the top 50 books out there uh, of all time. It's an incredible, incredible book. But um, the thing about love languages is if we're not thinking about them, then we will we will think we're communicating to someone else, but we're really not. Now, listen to what these love languages are. One of them is words of affirmation. Another one is quality time. Another is gifts. Another is physical touch, and another is acts of service. Now, those are five different ways that that we can communicate to someone else that we love them. Um, When you think of the significant people in your life, what love languages do you think they speak? I mean, think, pick, pick one person, whoever first came to your mind. What's that person's love language? Do they appreciate it when you use words to affirm them? Are they the kind of person that would just prefer you spend time with them? Are they someone who appreciates a gift? I'm not sure many people don't appreciate gifts, but some people really zone in with those. Are they someone who appreciates physical touch? 
Are they someone who appreciates an act of service? Now, to me, understanding someone else's love language is a more difficult question than we most than most of us would even consider and think. Because um, what we don't realize is that instead of seeing things from the other person's perspective, we are most naturally wired to see things from our perspective. So when we're speaking to this other person, trying to communicate that we love them, we tend to use our love language to communicate to them that we love them. If I'm someone who appreciates acts of service, guess what I'm naturally going to do? I'm naturally going to serve someone else, especially those important people in my life, and I'm going to be mystified that they don't see me saying I love you with my act of service. Good book to read. That's as far as we go with that. But it got me thinking, what's God's love language? What, what is it that I could say to God that will tell him that I love him? You see, I think, being the creatures of habit we are, that we probably have a love language that we're speaking to God and we're actually projecting ourselves onto God. And we're speaking a love language to him that falls short of actually communicating to him that we love him. We're speaking our love language to God. Here's the thing. God is unimpressed with our good works. Yet we still try to gain his favor by trying to be better. But he gives us the cure for that. He says in Ephesians 2, For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not, a, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. God is not interested in your good works. And yet, we try to do good works and think God's going to be pleased with us. God does not need anything we have. But that doesn't stop us from giving and doing and expecting that God is going to be pleased with us. Or more to the point, that God will then be in our debt. Listen to God. God is speaking. Psalm 50, verse 12. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. If I needed something, you would not be the person I would tell. I mean, he's God, right? And um, God is so over us thinking that we could ever do enough to buy his love. He inspired Peter to say something that sounds very harsh. Peter had an interaction in the book of Acts with a guy named Simon Mag Magus. Simon Magus was a guy who was very prominent in his community. He was sort of a, an illusionist, a, a sorcerer of sorts. And people used to come to him and he would be able to do these incredible things. He actually talked about having the power of God. Well, when he saw the apostles healing people and he saw the Holy Spirit coming on people, he, it says in the book of Acts, came to faith in Christ. And he, it says he bowed his knee to Christ and, and he became a believer. And then as he hung out with the apostles and he watched them, they would lay their hands on people. This was something that was just for the apostles. It's not the way God does it now, but... The apostles were his representatives laying the foundation for the church. And so they would lay their hands on people and they would receive the Holy Spirit. And Simon Magus, being the good businessman that he was, he went, went to the bank, cleaned out his account. He brought his money and he laid it at Peter's feet. And he said, Peter, here you go. Use this to promote God's kingdom all I want. I mean, it's really nothing. I just want the Holy Spirit. I want to be able to give the Holy Spirit to other people. Listen to what Peter said. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Now, we look at Simon Magus and we think, oh, what an idiot. Everybody knows that. Well, nobody knew it then. The Holy Spirit was a... I mean, they'd heard about the Holy Spirit. They'd read about Him in the Old Testament. But they really didn't know a lot about the Holy Spirit because God had never come and dwelt in, among them and in them. It was a brand new thing. 
So, don't just focus on that one gift. Focus on us and our feeble attempts to earn God's favor. Realize that whatever we do to earn God's love, to make him be in our debt, anything like that, Peter would say similar words to us. To us, May your silver, may your whatever perish with you because you thought that you could do that thing and curry God's favor. What is God's love language? Is the most important question, I think, that needs to be answered. Because love the Lord your God is the number one commandment throughout all the Old Testament. In the book of Deuteronomy in particular, it's listed several times. Here's a couple of passages. You shall love the Lord your God. Now, now let me stop for a second. He's not saying, hey, you know what? It might be a good idea for you to love the Lord your God. He is commanding it. Now think about this. He's commanding you in how you are supposed to feel. Or is he? Is the biblical concept of love a feeling? Now see, we've got to get through our cultural mindset. Our culture tells us that love is a feeling. Love is an emotion. And there are feelings and emotions associated with it truly, even from a biblical perspective. But love is something a little bit different. And I think as we explore these passages together, we'll see that. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him? You shall therefore love the Lord your God, chapter 11 says. Loving God is so important that God's blessing is contingent on obeying the command to love him. Deuteronomy 11. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today. What's the command? To love the Lord your God. How do you do that? Serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. He will give rain on your land in its season. The early rain, the latter rain. And you will gather that so that excuse, excuse me so that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil and he will give grass in your fields for your livestock and you shall eat and be full not only does god commit himself to bless them to bless their harvest their livestock and their livelihood but then he goes on <clears throat> later in the chapter to say that he will bless them as a nation he will cause them to grow he will cause them to flourish if they will do this one simple command if they will love him. For if you are careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, holding fast to him, then the Lord your God will drive out all these nations before you. You will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot tread shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river the river Euphrates to the western sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay fear of you and dread of you on, on the land that you shall tread on as God had promised. All of that, if they will follow the one simple command to love the Lord their God. And then, you see throughout the Old Testament that God tests that love. You've seen hints of what God's love language is in the passages we've looked at, but this one has another hint as well. Listen to what happens as God allows, and not just allows, but purposes and brings tests into the lives of his people. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says... Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or of that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you. For the Lord your God is testing you. To know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. 
and uh, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. You see how it's throughout the book of Deuteronomy. Every time we have something that comes into our path and we have the opportunity to choose it above God, that's a test. And it's not something that God doesn't already know. He does it to help us understand. It's like the old hymn says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord. Take and heal it. I can't remember the name, the rest of that phrase. Someone help me. Seal it for the courts above. <laughs> my mind wanders too, not just my heart. God calls us to such a high standard. He tells us, he commands us to love him. But the thing that we need to continue to grow to appreciate about our God is he never calls us to do something that he does not give us the ability to carry out. You see, God knows us. I mean, in the passages we've looked at, he says that we're to express our love for him by choosing to listen to him. When we choose to obey him over the maneuverings of our own minds, we're saying we love him. When we prefer his voice over the voices of the charismatic smooth talkers or our own stinking thinking, where we convince ourselves that we're worthless, that we have nothing to offer when God made us in his image and he poured his gifts and abilities into us. Or we think... On the opposite side of that, we don't need God. We don't need God's people. We don't need God's giftedness. We don't need no stinking church. We don't need it. Because we can handle it on our own. That's just another way of us saying, I prefer myself over God. How in the world are we supposed to love God? Well, loving God is not, does not begin with a feeling. Loving God begins with an act of the will. To love God is to choose God, to prefer God above every other thing, every other person. But He knows that even when the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we will struggle. And so he says, I'm not going to leave this one to you alone. I'm going to come alongside you, and I'm going to help you. So again, back in the book of Deuteronomy, this time in chapter 30, look at what he says in verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, so that you may live. He calls us to love him, commands us, and then he empowers us. And he tells us that he's going to make that happen. So, God told Israel if they obeyed him, they would enjoy his blessings. If they disobeyed him, they would experience his curses, they'd be destroyed as a nation, and scattered to the four corners of the earth. And the Old Testament ends with a small remnant back in Jerusalem, back in Israel. And most of Israel scattered throughout the, all, all the earth. They couldn't do it. They couldn't prefer God over the gods of the land. They couldn't prefer God over the gods of money and power and position. They couldn't prefer God over the other false gods, the false idols, that their hearts continue to churn out. Nothing's changed. John Piper, I think, is the first one who, who pointed out that human beings' hearts are idol factories. There are so many things that compete in our lives for preference over God. 
And yet he tells us that he's going to enable us to, to choose to love him. And so Jesus comes on the scene 400 years after the closing of the Old Testament canon. And he continues with this theme. He says, you shall love the Lord your God. But as Israel came to know, we have come to know as well that we can't do this in and of ourselves. We don't have the ability. But the key to understanding what it means to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to, to, to prefer Him over everything is found in a passage in Isaiah chapter 5. Now again, a lot of this message is just me reading Scripture back to you. So listen to these words from Isaiah 5. See if they sound a little, little familiar to what Jesus is about to teach. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. He put in all this effort. He went to get some of the grapes so that he could make wine out of it, and the grapes were foul. They were, they were sour. They weren't good. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard than I have done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now, let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste, and it will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain, no rain on it. But the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold a cry of distress. So the picture is of this, this vineyard owner who went to all this effort, built this vineyard, planted the, the right sorts of seeds, and as the plants grew up, the grapes were not good. But when he came to his vineyard, he was looking for fruit. What you'd expect. And the fruit that he was looking for was loving obedience that showed up in justice and righteousness. And instead, he found bloodshed and distress. When he found it that way, he tore down the walls and he allowed it to be trampled. He allowed it to be destroyed. I think the disciples would have had this very well known to the Israeli mind passage in mind when they heard Jesus teach out of John chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Now think for a second. God planted these seeds in the Old Testament. He allowed them to cultivate them and, and, and they worked the ground. This time, God himself plants the vine. Who's the vine? Jesus is the vine. And the Father is the vine dresser. So, God himself got involved. He was involved then, but he got involved personally through his Son. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit you're thinking Isaiah 5. Remember what happened to our people. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Just like Israel and Judah, if someone is not connected to Jesus, they will eventually be taken away and, and burned and separated from Christ for all eternity. Bearing fruit requires something of us. Jesus is the vine, and if we're connected with him, the fruit bearing comes if we do something. So, verse 4 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So the question is, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? What does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, the word literally just simply means remain. 
to be connected with him. So as, as I looked in the gospel, I looked for this word remain or abide. And, and you can understand the, the, the meaning of a word by its context. Remember, I taught you a while ago the exegetes cheer. Anybody remember what that is? Context, context, context. Exactly. Thank you. So you can't just go to a Bible dictionary to understand the meaning of a word. You have to look at the context because there's a field of meaning that every word will have. For instance, the word trunk. You could be thinking of the front of an end of an elephant. You could be thinking of the rear end of a car. You could be thinking of something big that your grandma packed all her stuff in that you get to look through once in a while. You can, you can think of, there, there's a field of meaning. Well, <clears throat> there's a field of meaning with every single word, and we can't just look at the Bible dictionary to say what this thing means. So I looked at what the word remain or abide, how it's used. So look at what it says. Um, to remain is to believe in, to put your trust in, to remain in or put your trust in Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Whoever feeds, uh, feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now, I picked just that little phrase out of there because it is so stark. Jesus chooses this almost grotesque language to say, if you want to remain in me, here's what's going to take. You have to partake of my death. You have to partake of my blood, my, my broken body. When, when you put your faith and trust in what I did for you on that cross, then you are connected with me and you abide in me. You remain in me. And when you hold fast to that teaching, that's what he means by saying we need to remain in him. Jesus, or excuse me, John spells out what it means to remain in Jesus when he says this. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning, what you heard from the beginning was uh, Jesus' death and his sacrifice on your behalf, his burial and his resurrection. Let that, he says, abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. To abide or remain in Christ is to believe in him, to hold tight to Jesus' sacrifice for your sin. And now I think we're ready to finally begin to understand what God's love language is. A couple more quick passages in the Gospel of John. John 14, 15, we read, If you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. When we live in obedience to God, he responds with a deepening friendship. He opens himself up to us in a way that we could never have imagined that God, the God of the universe, would ever. Look at what he says in verse 21 of John 14. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him, or reveal myself to him, or have deep, intimate, close, personal fellowship and friendship with him and with her. So, what do you think God's love language is? Those passages seem pretty clear, right? It seems that obedience is God's love language. <coughs> no, but thank you for playing. Obedience is not God's love language. So here's the thing. We as humans would love for obedience to be God's love language. Because we can do that. I, 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 can, I do the obedience thing really well, except when I don't, of course. Which is just as often as the other. Can you imagine what it would be like for us if, our, if, if, if loving God was just for me to obey Him? I mean, would there be any kind of security in that sort of relationship? Because, I mean, let's be honest. Was there a time last week you didn't obey God? No? I'm the only one? Yeah. Yeah. And God knows that. He's the one who inspired that hymn writer to say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. 
because he wanted he didn't want to rub our faces in it he wanted us to remember you can't do this on your own you can't do this on your own i'm the one who's going to have to come and and tear off the flesh of your heart to circumcise your heart to make it so that you can love me i'm the one who's going to have to do that for you obedience is not what god what tells god that we love him Think about this. Why would we obey him? Because we believe him. Because we have faith in him. I obey God because I trust him. I prefer him because I trust him. I choose to take God at his word when it comes to how I handle my relationships when it comes to how, how I handle my finances, when it comes to how I handle life, because I trust Him. I put my faith in Him, not my own abilities, not, not the world's mindset. I'm saying, I believe you, God. I have faith in you. I trust you. I believe what you said. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Many of you in this, in this room have told me that that's your life verse. But the question I have to wrestle with myself is, do I do that? Do I trust him in all my ways? Well, I know when I do, he makes my path straight, but do I do it? If I have to rely on myself, then I'm in trouble. And so are you. The language of love that says to God, you love him, is not obedience. It's faith. Obedience demonstrates my faith. The language I speak that tells God that I love him is the language of faith. And so, listen with fresh ears to a passage we, we looked at a few months ago. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith is the engine that drives the, the car or the series of cars of obedience and then accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. Faith is the language that, that says to God, I love you. Now, interesting thing, if you look at the Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> Hebrews eleven six kind of kicks it all off. Then throughout the rest of the chapter, you hear the stories of, of men and women of faith. And after every single one of these, it says, these people pleased God. We start off with Noah, and then we go to Isaac, Abraham, Jacob. We got all these different people, Samson, lots of different folks. And everything <clears throat> that we know about them is that they pleased God. And what was it that pleased God? Not the things they did, but the reason they did what they did. They had faith in God. Because they had figured out, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Any action motivated by my faith in God says to God, I you ever thought about that? Any action that says to God, I believe you, I trust you, I'm banking my life, I'm banking my world, I'm banking my eternity on you, says to God, I love you. It makes sense of, of a passage. It just strikes me, so I don't even remember the address. Someone will have to help me. But it says, anything that's not of faith is sin. Anything that's not of faith is sin. What, what's that mean? Well, it seems to me that it means that the core of who we are supposed to be is people of faith. Walking in faith after God. And whenever we get off of that and we stop saying, God, I love you, we're trusting in something else. We're wandering off into sin. I think God is so cool. Because, because in my own flesh, in my own humanness, I think I got this thing wired. And then God brings me up to the precipice and says, really? 
Who are you going to trust? You're going to trust you? You're going to trust your friend? You're going to trust your, your wealth? You're going to trust... Who are you going to trust? God continues working in each and every one of our lives, not because he needs to hear us say, I love you, but because we need to remember that he's everything. And our faith will communicate to him like nothing else that we love him. Any action motivated by faith in God says to God, I love you. So the question we have to ask ourselves right now and every day of this week, do I love the Lord my God? Or am I willing to walk in faith, trusting Him above all else? I can't pretend to know the step of faith that God wants you to take today, tomorrow, or next week. I know, though, that when you are presented with that step of faith, that step will move you away from the comfortable. It will move you away from the convenient. It will move you away from the socially acceptable into the wild, untamed, and completely exhilarating love of God. And we will experience Him like no other time in our lives. For some of us, today, the step is going to be seem small. For some of us, the step will be monumental. Maybe you're here and and you need to, to step across the line and put your faith and trust in Jesus. You've been trying to do it on your own for so long. You've been trusting in science. You've been trusting in knowledge. You've been trusting in wealth. You've been trusting in position and power. And today, God is saying to you, you know what? You need this. You need me. You need to put your faith and trust in me today, right now. Drive a stake down. Maybe the step you need to take is something less monumental. There's a decision that you've been wrangling through. There's a clear choice of faith. There's a clear choice of relying on yourself or some other idol. Will you say to God, I trust you? And in saying that to him, will you say to God, I love you? Maybe, maybe you've got a friend who needs to know about Jesus and God has been prompting you. Maybe that's the step of faith you need to take. To to step up and let them know that you love them, you love God enough tell them what they need to know. I know that before one o'clock today, you'll be given an opportunity to take a step of faith that will tell God you love him. Now, let me be really clear here. We haven't been talking about this at all, but just in case, when we don't take those steps of faith, God does not say, I'm done with you. He doesn't kick you out of his family. When you put your faith and trust in in Jesus Christ, you come into his family, he doesn't kick you out. But you're here today because your father had something to say to you. And he wants you to know that he loves you. And he wants you to say back to him, I love you by taking a step of faith today, whatever that might be. Now near the end of Jesus' time on the earth before he ascended back into heaven, he shows up on the seashore. Peter and all the guys are out fishing. And um, he calls to them from the seashore, and they don't recognize him. He says, hey, have you caught anything? No, we haven't caught anything. We've been working all night. He says, well, take your net and toss it on the other side of the boat. And they, I mean, they got nothing else to do. They, They do it. And when they start pulling the nets in, it's more fish than they know what to do with. And John, the disciple Jesus loved, leans over to Peter and says, Peter, It's Jesus. Now remember what Peter just did a little bit before. He denied Jesus three times. I can't imagine the emotions that were running through Peter's mind. Maybe you can relate. You've been presented with a step of faith and you said no. 
you're afraid Jesus doesn't want to talk to you. You're afraid Jesus doesn't want to see you. But he's there. And he calls them all in. And they come in with their fish. And here's an interesting little detail. It says that when they got there, there was fish already on the, on the barbie. It, was already, it had already been cooked. I don't know what they did with the fish they caught, but Jesus already took care of it. He had everything they needed. So they eat the meal. I wonder what the conversation was like. I mean, did Peter sit off by himself? I mean, everybody knew. But it's like the elephant in the room. What do you say? You ever felt like that? You blew it. You blew it so bad, there's just no way. Jesus asked Peter a question that I want to ask you. That I think God wants us to ask. Or let the Spirit of God ask us every day of the week. Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Now he doesn't, if you look in the Greek language, there's not a, a, a clear antecedent to who these are. Some interpreters say that he's saying, do you love me more than the other disciples? I'm not so sure he would com make them compare themselves like that. Some people say, you know, Peter, he was a fisherman. He went back to his, what he knew before Jesus. So maybe Jesus is saying, do you love me more than being a fisherman? I mean, he's eating Jesus' fish. He's got this other cluster of hundreds of fish over here. We don't really know what it is. But I do know this. We each have different things in our lives. I know I do. Where if I listen carefully enough, I can hear the Spirit of God say to me, Glenn, do you love me more than this? When you sit in front of your computer and you're tired and you need a break and you know you shouldn't go to the website, do you love me more than that? When you sit down to do your taxes and no one will ever know and you fudge some of the numbers, do you love me more than this? When you know that what your spouse needs is love and support and encouragement and in that split second you choose to either give that love and support and encouragement or to lash out, do you love me more than this? I don't know what that step of faith might be, but I do know that before one o'clock today, there'll be an opportunity for the Spirit to whisper to you and to me, do you love me more than these? What I am praying that I will be able to do and that you will desire to do as well is to tell God you love him by taking that step of faith today. Let's pray together. Jesus, you know that we would be at this moment, at this time in, in 2019, when you spoke those words to Peter some 2,000 years ago, and we would be being challenged to consider, do we love whatever more than we love you? Jesus, I pray that you would just, as, as our intercessor, enable us through the Spirit who's in us to take that step of faith. I don't know what the step of faith is that any of us need to take, but if you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus today, I want to encourage you to do that. You can just simply say, Jesus, I'm, I'm yours. I, I give myself to you just like I am. If you're interested in doing that, there's a the, con, the Connect card that Levi pointed out earlier. Fill that out if you want to talk to someone about that. I'd love to get with you this week and, and talk about that decision. If there's some other step of faith you need to make, feel free to, to put that on that card as well if you want someone to pray for you. But I would encourage everyone 
that the Spirit is saying something to right now. To just take out that card and say, I'm, I'm hearing, and I'm going to, by God's grace, take that step of faith. You put your name on it, you can leave it anonymous, whatever it is, to encourage us as we continue to listen to God's voice together. Father, thank you so much for your love and your goodness. Thank you so much for your Son, and thank you for the Spirit who lives in us. May each and every one of us take a step of faith today. In Jesus' name, amen.